Jacob, thank you, team. If you'd be seated for just a moment. Um, you don't have to turn to Genesis 3. I'll reference that. What I want to do is just kind of uh, give you a, a real simple uh, outline here, a grid for us to, to think on, and then uh, bring it around to how God answers that for us and how he responds. Um, this really was interesting process that we spent several weeks uh, talking about the glory of God. And I kept feeling like there was something more and that the Lord wanted to show us and, and help us to, to get. And, you know, on the surface, you're thinking, but there's nothing beyond the glory of God. That's kind of the ultimate, you know. And, and so uh, my prayer was, Lord, I, I don't know what I'm feeling, but I don't want to express it in a negative way. Does that make sense to you? Of uh, I don't want to express th- that I don't think your glory is awesome or enough or whatever, but I really need you to speak to my heart. And um, last week, God really gave me what I feel was the key to that, that he wants us to see. And that is the, the enemy's plan to undermine God's glory and to keep us living uh, short of that or beneath that is the effects of shame in our life. And we all experience shame, uh, some of us at debilitating levels. And shame has different effects in our life. It's connected to guilt, but it's far more subtle and far more pervasive than guilt. Uh, guilt is what we experience in a courtroom uh, that has to do with our guilt or our innocence. It's kind of a legal term. And so we can justify that in our mind, but shame goes beyond that. Shame is what we experience in community. When, when we try to hide from God's presence, um, like Adam and Eve did, or we try to hide areas of our life or who we are or who we've become, not just what we do. And so shame disconnects and separates us and makes us feel like an outcast, even in a family or even in community, even in a marriage, a love relationship. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be negative or abusive for us to experience that. Uh, Sometimes we don't even know why that it's passed on to, is it dark in here? Something's not right. Can you bring the lights up a little bit? Thank you. That's better. I was getting depressed. Man, shame, talking about shame. We're sitting in the dark, hiding. There's an illustration. Very good. All right. Hallelujah. So, so what was I saying? Yeah, shame, it's, it's negative. So here's the grid, just so we can get into this, because I feel like God really wants to meet us here and do something uh, unique uh, as we come and receive uh, communion tonight and then pray for one another. I really believe it's a point uh, of breakthrough, and if we'll receive the, the revelation that God wants us to have and then respond to that, uh, obedience is the first step to breakthrough. Amen? I'm quoting Ethan's message on Sunday morning, who's quoting me from staff meeting on, uh, on Tuesday. So, amen, all right? So, so here's what I want us to get. We're going to talk about three things. The, the entrance of shame, the experience of shame, and the language of shame. The, the entrance of shame. Okay, and the entrance of shame, of course, was in the very beginning in Genesis, and it's pervasive all through Scripture. It's amazing how much Scripture deals with shame. Uh, in fact, uh, in my brief calculation, when you take shame and uh, its derivatives of being um, uh, dismayed or being scorned, uh, ashamed, uh, reproach are all uh, connected with the root of shame. When you, when you put it on a scale, when most of us address the guilt side of that, 
uh, scripturally, but scripture deals about 10 times more with areas of shame and disgrace than it does guilt. And so understanding that, I think it's really important. So the first experience of shame in Genesis was connected with nakedness. And the a part of shame is still attached to that, uh, not just uh, nudity in that sense, but our physical bodies and how we respond to that. And so I think the connection that God wants us to see tonight is that when Jesus ministered to them and established a new covenant, he didn't say, this is my authority, this is my title, uh, this is my reputation, this is my whatever. He took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body. And I believe that the sin offering that Jesus made at that point went all the way back to the garden to deal with the root of shame that was connected to our bodies and our nakedness. Okay, when sin enters in, then, then it produces this language of shame as well. And, and the language of shame uh, in a word is doubt. And so the enemy comes in, what in the world is the woman doing talking to a serpent in the first place? Great question. And so everything starts getting confused and even natural order is disrupted. And so here we're Adam and Eve, clothed in the glory of God, experiencing the total innocence of, of how God had created them and who God had created them to be. There was no self-consciousness. Okay? And if there's one factor that's associated with our physical bodies... It's self-consciousness. And it, it wouldn't take long for us all to make a list of flaws in our bodies. Okay? And now then it would be the, the root of shame would say, well, I can make the list, but I ain't sharing it with you. Because the shame is connected with that. But we don't realize that, that when sin entered in, there was this realization. It says their eyes were opened and then they realized they were naked. Shame causes this realization and connects it to their nakedness. And God didn't have a problem with it, but Adam and Eve sure did. And immediately they tried to cover up. And, and one of the effects of shame is self-protection. Okay, we try to cover and we try to hide and, and we disconnect from relationships and we blame one another, even God, and then we, we cover for that. It's, it's self-protection, all right? So the first experience of shame was connected to the feeling of being exposed. Their eyes were open, they realized they were naked, so they hid. God comes in a redemptive way, ask Adam, where are you? He said, I was afraid because... I was naked. Now, nothing had changed. He had always been naked. Uh, a Adam was created like we all enter the world naked. And nobody goes to the hospital and, and sits there at the nursery uh, desk and just talks about how shameful it is that those babies don't have any clothes on. Instead, we all go to the nursery window at the hospital if we're family and connected and we have the same heart and innocence and spirit like Kim does. And the first thing she wants to do is unwrap the newborn and take all their clothes off. And, and it's not about that she has this inordinate, weird fascination with nakedness. It's the fact that she, she, there's such an innocence that is there. Are you with me? But shame distorts the whole thing. It distorts how we see their eyes were open. Their eyes had always been open. They realized they were naked. They'd always been naked. It's just the fact that shame puts the focus and the emphasis on themselves rather than on God and his presence. It's not about who I am or what I have to hide or, or where I find myself or when I'm exposed, when I'm beholding God in all of his glory and walking with him 
there's this openness, there's nothing to hide, there's this purity, there's this innocence. It has nothing to do with my physical body. That, that's just a container for my spirit to connect with God's spirit and, and experience the holiness and purity of all that he's created. And when sin enters in, shame comes with it, and the devastating effects are, are still having ripple effects in our lives. We still come back to dealing with those things. And the powerful thing about shame is that it, it's not just something we experience on the outside. It's not even just an emotion that gets down in our heart. Shame eats its way to the core of your being. So that it's not something that's happened to you that was shameful. It's something that you're connected to that you cannot get rid of. The, the feelings of uncleanness, no matter what you do, you can't cleanse yourself. We had some friends years ago in ministry that uh, the, the, the husband uh, made a tremendous mistake and, and did some really shameful things and brought shame and reproach to his church, to his ministry, to his family. And, but the devastating thing for us, and I still remember the experience of his wife showing up at our door. And, and the, the, she was a beautiful uh, woman, but just the, the look on her face. And then it was her complexion and then her skin as she came in and, and sat down. And she had basically, because of her his actions that she did not participate in, but experienced the shame of his actions that she sat in a bathtub and she felt so unclean and dirty that she scrubbed herself with a dish cloth until her skin bled all over. And so, of course, you know, all we could see was her hands and her face, but I mean, she rubbed her face and and her arms and her body raw, trying to wash off the uncleanness that was in her spirit, not just her physical body. One of the expressions of shame in scripture is to uh, spit in someone's face, an expression of shame. Another one is to have mud or dirt wiped on you. Uh, one expression of shame that's connected with grief and mourning is putting ashes on your face. And another one that's pretty gross, but very effective for the illustration purposes for us to see is that God said because of their unfaithfulness to him, uh, that he would take dung and wipe it on their faces. And as a sign of their uncleanness. And the power of that with us all is there's few things more unclean or gross than that, except maybe our spit or vomit. And shame gets to work in people's lives, and it's beyond the words of expression, uh, the power of bulimia it is that feeling of shame in someone's life that they have to purge themselves and so they vomit, or many times they'll take a great amount of laxatives, and so the other aspect. But it's not the fact that the, the uncleanness is on our skin or on our faces. We can wash our face, but we can't wash our hearts and our insight. Except the presence of God and the Word of God is like a a well springing up and the washing with water through the word isn't just bathing. It's washing us on the inside and cleansing our spirit, cleansing our heart, cleansing our minds and our thoughts from acts that lead to death. Are you with me? Okay. So I don't want to make you uncomfortable with that, but the reality is scripture goes to that extreme to describe for us the effects of shame. Those aren't my illustrations, that scripture. And it makes us a little uncomfortable until we realize that, that God so wants our hearts and so wants his children to experience the privilege of being sons and daughters of a wonderful king, a good king, a loving king, a powerful king, 
And he wants you to experience that level of glory and splendor and honor instead of shame. But the enemy's deceptive tactics were just like in Genesis where he comes and if he can get us to believe the lie, he can speak the language of doubt. When we receive that in our heart, did God really say? And so we're not just questioning what God said, we're questioning God's character and God's heart. Why would he not want us to have everything? He did say we could have everything, but he did say as well, not that tree. Because there is no freedom without choice. And so we are free to love God, and the power of that is when we make the choice to serve God, when we make the choice to love God, when we make the choice to worship God, then we're directing that, and it's breaking off the shame and bringing us into God's presence, where as we experience that, then with unveiled faces, we can all reflect God's glory. Are you with me here tonight? So the first aspect of that, the the first experience of shame was connected with nakedness. And that uh, brought the feeling of being exposed, the need to hide, and self-protection. Here's the next. The language of shame. The language of shame. Here, Here are some key words that go along with shame. Listen to these words. Inferior. Alienated. Embarrassed. Minority. Ridiculed. Weak, powerless, failure, different, insulated, rejected, inadequate, humiliated, ignored, loser. Now, as powerful as those words are, most of them are connected with feelings that can change or that are temporary. We can be embarrassed, but we don't stay embarrassed. The enemy uses embarrassment as an entry point for shame. And then the confusion comes in that when we're, when we did something that embarrassed us or someone else's actions embarrassed us or a situation that was even totally innocent, but, but because of the timing or whatever, now we're embarrassed. Oh man. And we feel that our physical body reacts to that. We flush or, uh, whatever we look away. There's a physical expression, but then the emotional impact and it brings an entry point for shame. And the enemy who's the accuser of the brethren, not only brings us back to that event that caused the embarrassment, but then ingrains that within our heart. It's not the fact that you were embarrassed or that you embarrassed someone else. It's the fact that you are embarrassing. And so therefore, then it goes on. And shame just keeps working down inside of us like a bad sliver. And, and it, the, the more we try to get it out, the deeper that it goes. The, the language of shame is comprised of what you are called, how you are spoken to, tone of voice. People can say the right words, but it can be very demeaning. That's why sarcasm is so insidious. It, it is of the devil because it's the enemy's substitute for speaking the truth in love. It's what we're called to do. Shame gives rise. Shame breeds sarcasm. I'll say it that way. Because it doesn't have to be loving and it doesn't have to be true. And you don't even have to understand which component is which. You, You can just say something and then say, oh, I was just kidding. Oh, I was just being sarcastic. But the effects of those words go down into people's spirit and they create mistrust. They, they separate the relationship instead of drawing us in. Where someone speaks the truth to you, even if it's hard for you to hear, it's the thing that God uses to bring freedom. And when, it's mixed, when truth is mixed with love, it is powerful in drawing you in, drawing you closer, bringing you near, rather than pushing you away. 
Sarcasm separates, truth and love embraces. Does that make sense? That's a good word picture, amen? So, so, so the language of shame is compromised, comprised of what, not only what you're called, names that you're called, how you're spoken to, and what you call yourself, and how you speak to yourself. Uh, psychology calls it self-talk. Um, we call it things we call ourselves when we're embarrassed. Man, I'm so stupid. I, I was just an idiot. I just whatever. Um, so to to uh, put myself out there a little bit, um, even when we've experienced shame, we can't. We don't always identify it. And, and I think shame is much more difficult for men to identify and address than it is for women. Okay, that, that's not a sexist comment. That's just my thinking and processing. And sometimes we genuinely don't know. But the, uh, I, I, don't, I, I remember circumstances like everybody had when I was little that... Uh, I would just go through clumsy stages, just be awkward, and, and I'd trip and fall or do something. I remember one time in a junior high uh, football setting, it was like one of the first weeks of practice. Uh, you know, I was still getting used to when we wore the big long cleats, you know, and, and I was getting used to those. And so I was going in for a tackle and just tripped and fall, fell flat on my face. And the the grass was stuffed in my face mask. And when I got up, all the kids, you know, and it was funny. And so it was that whole deal. But what I felt was that whole sense of embarrassment of, man, what an idiot. You, you can't even run, let alone hit somebody and tackle somebody. And what, it's the entry point for that. Okay, fast forward to this week. And uh, Kim and I went to the store. Was that Monday. Can I tell this story? Okay. It's, it's about me. It's not about you. Um, we, and we bought a new, what do you call those things? The mattress topper for our bed. And so, we, you know, it's kind of heavy and it's a big foam thing. So we put it out there and it had plastic wrap around it. And so I cut off the plastic wrap, but it was wrapped around several times in the, the, uh, we have king size bed, so the topper was pretty heavy. So I laid it up on our bed, and our uh, bedroom's kind of weird, where it's got the main floor, and then it's got like a step up, in our in a big place back there where our bed sits. And so I was on the end of the bed, and I'm pulling the plastic, and so I pulled it and I pulled it some more, and then finally, you know plastic's not going to beat me. So I gave it a jerk. And when I did it, the whole thing came loose and I, my momentum carried me backward and I missed the step and, and just did a complete somersault. Now to my credit, I, I did a backflip and landed on my feet. And, and I mean, if we could play the video, I'm sure, you know, we could do the Olympic scoring it had to be 9.5, but I really didn't stick the landing, but I did come all the way over and land on my feet. And so Kim didn't realize what was going on. Elliot walked around the corner, and so they're both standing there. And the normal reaction in our house for all of the female side of the family, when there's any kind of stress or awkward situation or whatever, is to laugh. And so Kim laughed. And she was like, Wow, hon, you did a backflip. What she didn't realize was I hurt my knee and, and my neck. And I wasn't 10 years old anymore. Now I'm 50 something. I don't even remember. And so I'm not quite as agile. I, I was still looking for props for, man, I can't believe you didn't break your back and you stuck the landing, big guy. And so instead what we got was this laughter. And it was a very awkward thing because I, I certainly knew Kim's heart. She wasn't laughing at me. She was laughing at the situation because it was awkward and I'm sure somewhat comical to see this old guy flipping across the bedroom 
when, when we're just trying to do some simple task here together. And Elliot was like, wow, dad, what happened? And so, but that experience, okay, ingrained it and I couldn't respond. I started to respond anew in my mind, Kim's reaction, okay? But in my heart and in my spirit, I went all the way back to junior high football and felt like an idiot. I can't even stand up and walk in my own bedroom. Now that may not make sense to anybody else. It makes total sense to me. So you can just change the circumstances and the people involved in your scenario, but just wave at me if you can identify, okay? And so it's that deal of, so I spent several hours outside, not because I was mad, or that I was upset with Kim, but because I was trying to process what's going on. Why do I feel what I feel? And thinking, you know, that was stupid. Now my knee hurt, that aggravated me a little bit, but Kim didn't do that. It was, part of that was just aggravated at getting old. Part of that was, I just wanted to find the devil so I could kick him in the face. So, so I realized he was probably standing there in front of me talking to me. And, and I was cooperating with the whole process of, man, that was really stupid, man. You, know, you should go in there and repent. No, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't need to repent. And, and I felt like, okay, this is getting dumber all the time. You're standing in the yard talking to yourself. Okay. And so the enemy was right there with me going, yeah, you're standing in the yard talking to yourself. That looks more dumb than you flipping across the bedroom. All right, and so the effects of that in our life, it, it, it doesn't have to be a, a profound thing. It doesn't have to be something devastating that the enemy can use the effects of shame to do the same things in a subtle way, to, to separate that relationship, to project our shame on somebody else. Not my fault, it's your fault. If you hadn't bought that stupid mattress topper, I, I wouldn't have had to yank on the plastic. So. See, and going through those things, it's like none of this makes sense because shame doesn't make sense because it was never God's intent for us to live in shame. It was God's intent for us to live in glory and never experience it. So you say, now what happens if we have? Well, the experience of shame has the same effect in all of our life. We feel exposed. We feel the need to protect ourselves. We feel the need to hide, to disconnect from relationships. And then the language of shame enters in uh, to, to the point where we begin to talk to ourselves in, in, in a tone or use words or call ourselves names that maybe someone else called and we're just repeating, we're just quoting them. So just a question to help you identify some of those areas tonight. When, when you talk to yourself in the language of shame, who are you quoting? Are, are you quoting the junior high PE teacher? Are, are you quoting a family member? Are you quoting a friend who called himself a friend? You quoting somebody who spoke those words over you? Who are you quoting? Because shame always accumulates lies. And the more we repeat them, the more we believe them. Here's the next thing. I shared with you some key words that went along with shame, but real shame requires more intensity. It's not just a feeling of embarrassment. It's what lingers beyond that. It's the self-doubt. It's the, all the process that I walked through, trying to figure out, why do I feel this? I mean, there was a physical reaction beyond the pulled muscle and sore knee. It, it, but it was deep inside. R real shame requires more intensity. It, it is not a temporary feeling. Shame goes to the core. B beyond uh, feeling to become a belief. This, this would be a more accurate list of words. Listen to these. To describe the language of shame. Unclean. Dishonored. 
filthy, shunned, disgusting, defiled, outcast, unlovable, discarded, repulsive, disgraced, worthless, loathed, scorned. The, the effects of shame are the last thing I want to touch on here and then turn this around, read some scripture for us. And that's the effects of shame. With, with real shame, there are no words. Because real shame takes us to extremes where words fall short. So we're tempted to express shame by doing disgusting things. Okay, we communicate three ways, words, gestures, and spirit. And when our spirit is wounded or cut off from the life of God because of shame, then the expression of that is most naturally through words, but sometimes words aren't enough. And so we express ourselves through our actions. Uh, We're familiar with the, the language acting out. Acting out is the process of actions where words seem to fall short, okay? And so we get involved in in the effects of shame in our actions that can be some of the things we described before of spitting in someone's face or even worse, um, the, the root of addiction goes back to shame, all addictions, regardless of what. And, and then it just goes deeper and deeper. If that's the, the fact that I'm experiencing shame, so it's painful, so I try to self-medicate my pain through whatever means, drugs, alcohol, sex, food, you name it, money. Uh, and I start these, the, that process, then it's a never-ending cycle. Because as soon as I don't dull the pain that I'm feeling, but don't realize shame is much deeper than a feeling, then I begin to experience those feelings again. And so, but now I've, I've perpetuated actions beyond my words. And instead of trying to tell somebody that I feel unclean or dirty or filthy or whatever, and I don't understand why, Confessing temptation is a lot easier than confessing sin. But the trap of the enemy is that he brings accusation with the feelings of embarrassment or shame or feeling left out or whatever that might be and puts the focus back on the little 10-year-old boy who's left out there all by himself feeling stupid. But now it's a 50-year-old man who's experiencing those same feelings, but it doesn't make any sense because we're 40 years down the road. And so along with that comes condemnation and feelings of helplessness, and you'll never change, and you can't do this by yourself. So are you with me? Shame stinks. So the, the effects of that as it's working in our life is that we begin to, to act out in whatever way which creates these patterns in our life of addictions or sin cycles. You know, addictions kind of become a buzzword in our society for whatever. And, and so, but the process is that we're trying to do it in our own strength or, or find a method from men rather than turning to God. So here's the great news. God's answer for shame is glory. Now that may seem a little mystical, a little out there, a little whatever, so let's bring it down to to where we are, okay? In the garden, they realized that they were naked, but, but when we come to God in his glory, it's not just forgiveness, it's not just the fact that we're loved. God says love covers a multitude of sin. 
But beyond that, it's not just covering our sin so we don't have to deal with it. It's not covering up like Adam and Eve did. God covers us with robes of righteousness so that not only can he cleanse the sin instead of just covering it up, he can totally remove it from our lives. That he brings us into this relationship then to where the unclean become clean and the clean become holy in the Lord. Isaiah 6. We talked about it in the glory of the Lord. Isaiah saw the Lord knowing that Moses said, God said to Moses, no man can see me and live. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord and lived because he realized his own uncleanness and he cried out to God that he was unclean and God came and touched him. Now in the Old Testament, you were unclean if you touched something unclean. Here, God in his glory reverses the process and in his holiness, the the holy God touches the unclean lips of the prophet with a coal of fire and he is cleansed. God is not unclean because he touched him. Okay, there are three eras of shame. Before Christ in the Old Testament, during the ministry of Christ on earth, and he exemplified the the same thing. I only live to glorify the Father. I only say what the Father says. I only do what I see the Father telling me to do. And so Jesus went around engaging the unclean, casting out unclean spirits, touching unclean people, uh, uh, touching dead bodies, raising them from the dead. In all of those unclean situations, the scripture says you would be unclean if you even touched that person, ate that food, experienced that. But Jesus came in the holiness and the glory of God to represent it on the earth. And it was the holy making the unclean clean so that then the clean could become holy as he was. Okay, don't worry about taking notes on that. Just open your spirit and receive because somebody's got it, needs to get that, All right? Then the last aspect of that in God's glory is that the outcast and rejected become accepted, adopted, and loved as children of the king. Okay, the effects, this self-awareness, this eyes open, this nakedness, the emphasis on the exposure, God deals with that through his glory. He clothes us in his glory. He clothes us in robes of righteousness. He gives us garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Uh, The New Testament says, clothe yourselves in Christ. Clothe yourselves with Christ. Clothe yourselves with humility. See, clothing is the antidote for nakedness. Appreciate you all obeying scripture tonight. Okay, you're a lot less self-conscious and we're a lot less awkward than the fact that we all wear clothes. But what shame does is it's not about the clothes we wear. We still feel naked and ashamed even with our clothes on. Or we compare clothing of who's dressed nicer or whatever. We hear all the time the effects of shame when we're talking to people who who really want to know God or have an experience with God or or find an answer for their life and their uncleanness. But immediately shame confronts. It's like, man, I'd love to come to church, but I don't don't have anything to wear. I I don't have any church clothes. And my answer is always the same. Then, then wear the church clothes that you have. There's no such thing as church clothes and street clothes. That, that what God wants is you to be clothed with Christ and, and then wear whatever you have to honor him and, and to, to express that modesty of what God's doing in your life. But it, to me, I never hear that in the sense of um, uh, people make an excuse not to connect with God. It, it's just the speaking the language of shame. Here's what I want us to see. I want us to read uh, two passages of scripture here and and tie all this together, those three aspects. Isaiah 54 is the first one. Isaiah 54 uh, follows, obviously, Isaiah 53, not just in sequence, but the the message of Isaiah 53 is the prophecy about Christ. 
and the servant king coming to be the sacrifice for us. And so as a result of that, then Isaiah 54 begins with these words, sing, O barren woman. Barrenness was a, 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 a mark of shame, especially in the Old Testament, but, but all the way through the New, because you didn't have anybody carry on the family line. It was like your name and heritage and reputation and all that had been cut off. And that sense of emptiness and barrenness. Sing, O barren woman, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, who have not labored with child. More are the children of the desolate woman than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. This is a prophecy. Okay? But he's speaking as if it's legitimate, as if it's real. Sorry, my iPad keeps messing up. Let me read it from my real word here. Where are we? Verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the, your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. A barren woman who had no children wouldn't add on to her house. There would be no reason to expand. But here the word of the Lord says, enlarge the place of your dwelling, stretch out your tent cords, do not hold back. One of the effects of shame is to hold us back from walking in faith, from stepping in to who God created us to be and what God's called us to. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left, your descendants, plural, will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. Do you hear the language of shame in that? That God's addressing with his glory. You will forget the shame of your youth. And remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted or rejected and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Hallelujah. Now listen to these uh, words from Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Jesus went into the temple when he declared his purpose. And this was the place that he turned to when they handed him the scroll. He turned to the, unrolled it to the prophet Isaiah and read these words and proclaimed them in their presence as being fulfilled that day. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Watch this. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness, uh, the doTERRA essential oils, God says here, they're in the word. Instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Okay? Shame destroys beauty. And when we feel 
the, the beauty that God wants us to feel or experience, one of the terms we use in that is splendor. And here God said that, that he's going to take off the ashes and the oil of mourning and all of that. And he's going to bless us and bring an anointing on our life that's going to, that we're going to wear like a garment. Instead of the spirit of despair, which is what shame produces in our life, that we wear. Have you ever seen people and you don't even need to know what they're going through, but you see it? We say, I see it all over your face. Or you see it in their body language. Or, or, or you see that. Because despair becomes like clothes we wear. Sometimes it's constricting like a straight jacket. Words that bind us up. Other times it's just, it doesn't fit right. It's like a big heavy coat that gets wet and we just, we drag it around and it wears us out. That's a spirit. But God said that he wanted us to be oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And then watch the, the effects of God's glory working through our life instead of shame holding us back. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the places long devastated. Shame brings devastation in people's life. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Generations. Aliens and shepherds, aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called, you will be called priests of the Lord. And you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. The blessing of the firstborn to receive that inheritance. Instead of disgrace, one of the effects of shame, they will rejoice in their inheritance. The inheritance is what you receive. The heritage is what you pass on. And so here, God says, not only will I bring you into the family, I'll give you the place of honor, a double portion blessing, and that instead of disgrace, you'll receive, uh, you'll rejoice in the inheritance, and they will also inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robber robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the people. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations." Just like there's a language of shame, there's a language of glory. And that language of glory is thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Where Isaiah prophesied, they will be called priests of the Lord. 1 Timothy 2 says, you are the priests of the Lord. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you should declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I believe God's word for us that if we'll embrace it is that God no longer wants us to live, walk, experience any level of shame. He wants us to come to him and to receive of that glory just like Jesus stood before those and he offered his own body, the bread, and then he offered his own blood, the cup, as a new covenant and then he established it in love. He declared in, Isaiah, in John 15, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken. God makes the unclean clean. 
and, and then we feel accepted and, and confident to approach him. But he takes it one step beyond that and says, not only are you clean, you are holy. Not just forgiven, brought in and made holy and robed with the garments of a priest. And you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Not speaking to individuals, all of those who come to Christ. That, that it's not just about uh, our outward clothing. It's about what God's doing on the inside. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. creation. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Colossians 3 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And so as we come to the table tonight, I just believe God wants to meet us here in a profound way, in the simplicity of that word, saying, would you receive this sacrifice to break the power of shame in your life at every level? over your minds, in your hearts, the part that's worked all the way down into your spirit and your identity. And as we receive the broken body and as we receive the cup of the Lord tonight, his blood shed for us, for our forgiveness and our cleansing, it creates within us this new creation, this new identity, this spirit of righteousness that should cause praise to spring forth from our hearts. Can we thank him tonight? Father, we just give you praise and glory, and we thank you for this sacrifice that is more than enough for us. And as we come to receive tonight, Lord, I pray that we would just come in faith, receiving all that you intended for this to be in our lives, receiving the full measure and benefit, not allowing shame to undermine any aspect of the power of the broken body of the Lord being an all-sufficient sacrifice for us. A burnt offering was totally consumed. It was the most holy unto the Lord. And so, Lord, as you gave all, and as your body was completely broken, totally consumed in taking our sin upon you and then taking it all away, Father, by faith tonight, I pray that we would connect at that point. As we receive of this cup and drink it into ourselves. Father, I thank you for the power of covenant working in our life. Not just feeling forgiven and feeling that we're loved. Father, having that reality established in our spirit, in the power of a covenant relationship that God says is everlasting that draws us back again when shame begins to work at us and uncleanness begins to infiltrate in our hearts. That Father, we just come boldly before a throne of grace and we find mercy to help us in our time of need. God, I pray that the power of your glory as we simply receive it, the way it was manifest on this earth and what Jesus intended for it to be in our lives as he gave his body as he established a new covenant in his blood. Father, we would receive tonight by faith in the same effect, the same power to not only destroy sin, but to destroy the shame that the enemy brings into our life with it. God, we receive tonight. And I pray that with unveiled faces, we would all reflect the Lord's glory. God, we thank you for it. We come tonight to minister life to one another, to receive, to pray, and to give. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Would you just come by faith tonight and receive? Come together. You may want to come with somebody and just take a moment, take a piece of the bread, take one of the cups. If you want to have a moment, just by yourself, returning thanks to the Lord, just praying specifically for those areas. Do you identify those roots in your life? Send the power of the sacrifice, the shed blood of Christ against it and receive the freedom and liberty that God wants you to have.
Father, wash us on the inside. Pray that the purifying effects of that, not just making us clean. Father, making us pure. Holy before you. God, I thank you that we see ourselves through your lens. And when we realize how you see us, it's with the garments of praise and the robes of righteousness. It's with the garments of the priesthood established in a place of authority before you and ministry unto you holy before the Lord Father I thank you that we don't have to cover we don't have to hide we don't even have to protect ourselves because it's not about us it's about coming to you Father offering that which you long to deliver us from so Father with unveiled faces and uplifted hands tonight I thank you that there is no shame, but the glory is ours in Christ Jesus, that we speak words of thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, for all that you did that we could never do. We speak words of praise, and we magnify and lift you up. We exalt you and exalt in you because of who you are. Father, in worship, we bow low, and we raise our hands high. God, we ascribe unto you the glory that is due your name, the privilege of the priests of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for what you're establishing in our hearts tonight. We thank you for the effect of that, not only in our church body, not only in our marriages, not only in our families, not only in our lives, not only in places of mourning and sorrow, But Father, in every place where the enemy brings resistance and tries to cause us to hold back from moving into all that you've called us to do and and the territory you've called us to possess and 
God, what you've called us to rebuild and renew and restore because of who we are and your spirit and presence working in us. God, we thank you for that tonight. Break the power of shame and help us to walk and reflect the glory of the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Me too. Bless you, everybody. Have a great night. Uh, Bless somebody on your way out. Encourage somebody. Share in the glory of the Lord. See you Sunday morning. Mother's Day. Got some great things for you. Please join us.